Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to make it through the next 20, 25, 50, 75 minutes. We'll just see what the Holy Spirit does um, without completely losing my voice. So y'all please forgive me for having a bottle of water up here. Um, <clears throat> before we dive into the sermon this morning, there is so much um, that I would like to say about this weekend, but, but here's the deal. Um, it wasn't my weekend. Um, it, it was obviously, it was God's weekend. It was about glorifying him, lifting him up. But um, it was also about the students. Uh, so several of them have agreed to come up and kind of talk just for a, a couple of minutes about what this weekend was all about. So I don't even know who all is, but if, if you said you were gonna speak this morning, why don't y'all come on up? There we go. Oh, wow. You can go first. So one thing that we talked about this weekend was that the church is one of God's blessings to us as believers as we are not meant to go through this life alone. Our Christian walk is supposed to be with other believers supporting and encouraging one another. And there is no possible way that we can do that if we are divided against one another. There's also no way that the church can effectively outreach and serve the community or each other if we're all against each other. And that was just one of the big things that he spoke about as the theme was community with an emphasis on unity is what he said. So. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me was yesterday morning, we were going looking at Acts and um, keeping in the theme with community, um, he was talking about how as soon as Paul was converted, um, he sought out the church immediately to join and just how important Paul felt that it was immediately after he um, found Jesus to be in community with other believers and be encouraged by them. One thing that got to me this weekend was as Christians, we need to try to outdo one another in good works and love one another and just outdo in one another in any way possible. One thing I learned this week was um, that even though if you're a believer, you still have some ground to do in Christ, that no matter what, you still have room to grow in Christ, so. Yeah. I learned that uh, God has given us this community of other believers so that we can work with one another and just work together to grow in Christ and in our relationship with Him. This weekend really showed to me that as a follower of God, a brother, a sister, a child of Him, that we need to work with one another, have peace, have strength, have courage. We need to learn to get along and we need to try and outdo each other with our good works and continue to spread the gospel. One thing is like how he, Gary said like, uh, one thing that we could say could change a lot of things. Something that I took out from this weekend was that you have to love everyone, like, no matter how hard it is, you still have to love everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you guys for, uh, for sharing this morning. Um, <clears throat> I would like to, to personally thank a few people, and by a few, I mean a lot, um, because here's the deal, weekends like this cannot happen if it's up to me or, or it's just Susanna and I, or even just the staff. It's, it is truly a, group, a community effort um, to, to put on things like that. Um, we, we had multiple small groups meeting throughout the county, just by Highland being represented, and, and some of those leaders you know, some that you don't, but uh, Lauren Walker uh, led our middle school girls. 
Kersky Graves led our high school girls. Will McCarty and Parker Lang, trust me, they needed to, had our middle school guys. Um, and Shane Ayers led our high school guys. Our host homes for the weekend, uh, Britt and Amy McCarty had our high school girls. Jason and Emmy Franklin <clears throat> had our middle school girls. Matt and Stacy Davis had our high school guys. Um, and Jason and Holly Putman had our middle school guys. Um, some of them were very quick to come up and tell me they can't wait to have them again next year. A couple of them I hadn't heard from yet, some little. <laughs> not to call a name, no. Um, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, I mean, and, and it was a great weekend, great uh, time in the homes and haven't heard of anything being burned or destroyed. So I call that a, a W. Um, kids got to eat and they eat a lot. Um, Quinn and Mary Carlisle, Fran and Rick Snowden, Regina Clark, Marsha Bennett helped out with the meals this weekend. Um, like David was saying, we had close to 400 people in this building all weekend. Um, and that, that requires people behind the scenes like Larry and Adam running sound, Rick uh, running the projection. So thank you guys for that. Um, they, they were traveling all over the county and no, nothing bad happened on the road. Um, our drivers, Jason Putman, Jason Franklin, Dave Carr, Michael Torres, thank y'all for um, uh, transporting our students. Um, and, and then the countless others who provided food to go to the homes, who uh, financially supported our students this weekend. Um, and most importantly, I, I, I don't know how many of you uh, either send me emails or, or calls or text messages to just saying, praying for you, praying for the students. And guys, your, your prayers did not go unheard. It was an incredible weekend. Um, did not have time over the last 12 hours, but at some point this week, I plan on making a, a brief slideshow that I'm gonna try to show over the next couple of weeks, just some pictures from our homes, from, from the worship services, uh, but even that's not gonna do it justice. Like David was talking about, there, I've been in student ministry since 2005, so coming up on 20 years, and I've been doing D-Nails, mine is missing a couple for COVID every year. I don't know that I've ever experienced the type of response to the Holy Spirit that I, that I was able to be a part of last. Larry, where are you? Raise your hand, buddy. Uh, right, yeah, raise it high. I don't know the people. There you go. All right, so this dude comes up to me this morning and he goes, you can put it down. <laughs> he goes, Clint, what was your favorite part of the weekend? And I was very honest with him. My favorite part was being able to sit um, about five rows back right there. Um, probably about 8.45 last night and stop singing and watch our students engage in worship. It was an incredible thing to see middle school students, high school students raising their hands and surrender to God's glory, coming to this altar by themselves and in groups to pray over one another, to pray and ask for uh, forgiveness, to pray and ask for boldness, to just get real with God. Um, and it was just an awesome, awesome weekend. So Faith Family, thank you for allowing us to do that. Um, like I said, I, I, it, it's hard to put into words exactly what this weekend was all about. Um, and if I did not mention you by name and you were a part of the weekend, I apologize. There were so many, I tried, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Like it's already been said, this weekend, the entire weekend for our students, for our leaders, for myself, it was centered around this concept of unity. You can see on the back of our shirts, uh, community with an emphasis on unity. And we really focused <clears throat> on Romans chapter 12, um, uh, verses three through five. And then last night, uh, verses nine through 21, really looking at what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a Christian. So this morning, what I want us to do is we're gonna jump ahead about three chapters and we're gonna kind of continue on with that concept. So we're gonna be in Romans 15 and um, we're, we're gonna be kind of jumping around a little bit. It's gonna be on the screen and I'll tell you where we're gonna be, but we're gonna be in all, like all of Romans 15. So if you allow me to do so before anything else, let's just dive into this. And we're gonna look at how he focuses, Paul being the author of the book of the Romans, focuses on two things, unity and mission. 
which is where we get this idea that we are united in the mission of Christ. So let's start, and like I said, we're going to start in verse 7. Uh, verse 7, and it says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So let's stop right there real quick. It says there at the very beginning of verse 7, welcome one another. Welcome one another. Why did Christians, why do we need to be reminded to do this? Other translations say, accept one another. Why should we need to be reminded to accept other people, to welcome other people? Why, why does this need to be said? Things were not simple in Rome, not saying they are now, but things were not simple in Rome 2,000 years ago. The Jewish Christians, men and women who were like ethically, like, 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 like uh, uh, nationally, like, like born into the, the Jewish faith, um, they were ethnically Jewish, that they had converted to Christianity, they tended to see themselves a little bit higher than the Gentiles who converted to Christianity. Uh, they, they saw themselves as leaders of the faith. And from their perspective, Christianity was the fulfillment of the faith that their people had followed for centuries. And technically speaking, they were not wrong. Christ can't come to fulfill the law, to fulfill the Old Testament. So it was just an, an, an extension of what they had believed, what they had been raised into. <clears throat> and like I said, they were right about that. The trap that some of them were falling into because of this was that they were believing that since they had been raised in this, they were on another level. I remember when I was in junior college, when I was at Colin, um, I was pretty active and pretty involved in the BSU. And we, we kind of had a running joke whenever we saw somebody do something that pulled them out of their comfort zone for the glory of God. They would like get a hashtag, get a, get a, uh, um, a text message that would just like, if it happened today, it would be like a hashtag and we would send them like a super Christian. You know, like, like that's how we would label each other. Uh, Gary, our speaker for the weekend, talked about this, how he and a buddy that he traveled with, they would try to outdo one another in carrying heavy things whenever they were traveling to, to speaking engagements and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and so um, what was happening was these Jewish Christians thought that since they had been raised in the faith, they were better. Than, than Gentiles who had recently been converted to Christianity. <clears throat> and the Gentile Christians, the men and women who were not Jewish and had converted, like I said, to Christianity, they felt frustration, obviously, over how they were being treated. It, it, it essentially resulted in them being treated as second-class Christians, as second-tier believers. If there was a difference of opinion within the church, the Jewish Christians always seemed to win out because like I said, they felt like they were higher, they were better. <clears throat> Throughout the book of Romans, um, up to this point, Paul has been confronting this tension, which is why Paul opens this chapter with the words, or with the word, therefore. If you, go back, <clears throat> if you go back and look in verse 1, you see that. This is the, the culmination of the teaching that has already come. And he says, welcome each other just as Christ has welcomed you. He reminded them against this, this thought that some were better than others. He reminded them again and again that Christ came for both the Jews and the Gentiles. If you skip ahead to verse 13, Paul continues this thought when he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. <clears throat> so how do we welcome one another? 
How do we welcome each other? How do we find unity in our diversity? How do we find common ground when so much about this world tends to divide us? Even within our own student ministry here at Highland, we have so many things that could drive a wedge between us. Some of the obvious ones being age, gender, the fact that we have eight different schools represented within our student ministry. That's a lot of rivalry football games and basketball and baseball and soccer. Um, there, there's a lot that could potentially divide. And we are reminded all throughout scripture, specifically here in Romans 15, that we are to welcome, except be unified, not divided. So how do we find our unity in, uh, throughout this diversity? And, and it's because our source is bigger than the diversity, our source of love, our source of our worship. The one that we need to have our attention on, our focus on is so much bigger than the things that could divide us. It is through Christ, it is through him that we are able to be filled with hope and be filled with joy. And as our hearts are transformed more and more to be like Christ, then we become people who overflow hope and joy. I told our students this morning, um, after we had gotten here, before we ate breakfast, that the whole purpose of weekends like this, of, of, of things like this, is so that them as students can be filled their, their uh, proverbial cup can be filled with Christ, with the love, the joy, and peace that Christ offers us so that they can go into their world and let that cup overflow so that they can go back to their schools, back to their, their teams, back to what, you know, the, the, the play practices and whatever it is that they're into and Christ can be exemplified in that. That's why we do disciple now to impact the world, not just the people in this room. So that we can be unified in that mission. <clears throat> Even as Christians, unity does not come naturally for us. You see that all over the place. In fact, I don't know if y'all realize this, but even within the United States, there are over 200 different denominations of Christianity. Um, Within the world, uh, there are over 41,000 different denominations, organizations, parachurches that claim evangelical Christianity. There's a lot that can divide us, even amongst believers. So when Paul wrote this letter, there were not 200 different denominations. There was one. And even then, they were having a hard time being unified under the banner of Christ. So how much more difficult is it for us today? But the thing is, Paul is still telling us, set aside the things that divide. Focus on the things that unify us. We find it easy to split when we disagree rather than to find unity. We say things like, I don't like the teaching. I don't like the person next to me. The music isn't that great. I have a problem or I have some type of drama with this person or this person. So our reaction is that I'm going to go find another church. I'm going to go find somewhere else that I can worship, not because I feel like God's calling me to go somewhere else, but because I have a problem. The focus is on us. When Larry asked me this morning what my favorite part was, and I've already told y'all, it was that I was able to take a step back and watch 41, I believe, of our students here not worried about the things that divide them. The only thing they were focused on is the greatest thing that can unify us that being Christ. They weren't worried about anything else that could potentially drive a wedge. All they were focused on was that God is worthy of our worship. And in that moment, that's where their heart was. Throughout the book of Romans, Paul challenges 
these Jewish <clears throat> and Gentile Christians to pursue unity, even at the cost of personal freedom at times. Paul is challenging them to step out of their comfort zone, to potentially have, be willing to set aside things that they value most for the thing, for the one that they should be valuing above all else. Paul's message was not to find the church that lines up closest with what they want. Paul's challenge was not saying, hey, find the one that does the music you like, or find the one that offers the classes that you like, or find the one that has the, the color scheme in the sanctuary that you like. By the way, we had a lot of people in this church this weekend coming through who'd never been here. And I can't tell you how many people have said they, they loved, you know, the renovation. So that's, that's whatever. But anyways, um, we need to be proud of what we have here is where I'm going with that. But anyways, <clears throat> Paul is not saying to, we need to focus on these, these things that are less. Paul is saying that we need to pursue unity. So that's the first step. The first point this morning is what are you pursuing? Are you pursuing the things that you want? Are you pursuing the things that, that you desire? Pursuing the things that fit within your plan, your purpose for your life? Or are you pursuing unity with others? And sometimes that means compromise. Sometimes that means personal sacrifice for the good of the body. We are to pursue unity. So what I want to, I want to skip ahead for a moment in Romans 15. Let's look in verses 25 to 27. Romans 15, 25 to 27, it says, At present, however, I, being Paul, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. He's talking about the Jewish Christians. So, I am going to Jerusalem to bring aid to the Jewish Christians from Macedonia and Achaia, being uh, Gentile Christians, have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. So at first glance, you read these three verses and you might be thinking, oh, that's a nice gesture. That's cool. They, they offered some, some gifts. They, these Gentile believers, they have resources that they are able to share with their Jewish believers, uh, uh, with their brothers who were born Jewish, uh, who, who are struggling significantly. Our church does this. We send gifts financially and other uh, to, to ministries, to churches, um, who do not have the resources that we have. Your tithes and offerings contribute to this, to being of assistance. That This is unifying believers that we probably will never meet this side of eternity. But we, we take part in this. But Paul reinforces something that he has been saying throughout this letter to the Romans with these three verses. And it's one that we need desperately to be able to apply to our life. And that is simply this, that there are no second class Christians. There are no second tier people. We are one body in Christ. So if, if some of you, I have absolutely no doubt, if you'd have come in here last night I say a majority of us would have been blown away by the worship experience. But some of you may have been so distracted by the fact that we had a full band and no organ, by the fact that it was much more upbeat contemporary than, than what you're accustomed to, by the fact that there were some 14 and 15 year old guys wearing hats. Y'all may not have even been able to focus on Christ because you were distracted by those types of things. And, and again, I don't believe that's all, but I know that that's some, that we allow ourselves to be distracted and think less of people who are engaging in worship because something is not to our liking. And Paul is saying that that is foolish. 
that that is such a major distraction that, that if that distracts you away from Christ, it has nothing to do with the other people. It has to do with your relationship with him. There are no second tier believers. We are one body unified in Christ. In the, in the culture 2,000 years ago, in this church, um, accepting a gift, it carried significant weight. Like, like there were catches, if you will. In fact, in one of the commentaries on the book of Romans that I read, uh, the author says, the gift is therefore a gesture of unity and equality. Accepting the gift is therefore a tacit admission by the Jewish Christians that Jews and Gentiles now stand on equal footing with respect to each other. So Paul was essentially driving home a, a, a point that he made to the church of Galatia as well in verses three, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter three, verse 28 of the book of Galatians, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Obviously, Paul knows that some are Gentiles and some are Jews and some are free and some are slave. He, he, he believes in the difference between males and females but what he is saying is when it comes to our relationship with Christ it doesn't matter what matters is we need him and he loves us and if there's anything else that's drawing your attention away from that then you have missed the point in Christ all of the ways that we classify ourselves are gone we are one body there is one thing that matters, and that is unity in Christ. So why is this issue so important? Why did we focus on this this weekend? Why am I preaching on this this morning? Why is this so critical? Why is it worth sacrificing personal freedoms, things that we might want, preferences that we want for this concept of unity? The reason why it is so important is that unity reflects a higher perspective, a greater confidence, and it enables believers to both see and pursue the mission that we have been called to. Each and every one of us are called to his mission. Tim Keller, a, a pastor and author, Man, I love reading his books. This is what he has to say on this concept. He says, gospel unity, <coughs> excuse me, gospel unity within the church and gospel mission to the world. These are two of the greatest themes of Romans and two of the greatest passions of Paul's ministry. The gospel mission to the world was Paul's driving message throughout his entire through, through everything that he wrote. Gospel mission, the fruit of unity is this mission. We are called to live with purpose. That's our second point. First one was to pursue unity. Second one is to live with a purpose. <clears throat> one of the... <clears throat> One of the greatest distractions from that purpose that we have in our life is disunity. In Romans 15, Paul sums up this calling, a calling that we share with him. And we see this in verses 14 through 20. And this is going to be the, the chunk of scripture that we end with. Uh, starting in verse 14, it says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. So I love how Paul does this. Um, as a parent, I get this. I understand his style of teaching right here because what he is doing is he is saying, look, there's so much about you that's good. There's so much you're doing right here in, in the church. And then, I, you know, but then he says, but on some points, I've had to write pretty boldly about you. I mean, again, as a parent, I get this. Leah, I, I love what you're doing here. You're, you do so much good. We got to work on this a little bit, though. So, I mean, y'all get, maybe I'm the only parent who does this. Um, 
But so I understand that this is what Paul is doing. Paul was confident that they were headed in the direction of what he challenged them to, just as I am confident that you and I, that we are heading in that direction as well. But there are still some things that we need to, that we need to work on. There are still some things that, that, that we uh, um, need to be uh, um, putting some effort into. <clears throat> so keeping going in this verse. Because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Again, Paul emphasizes that this does not happen under our own power. This is not something that we are able to do on our own. It is through the Holy Spirit. Even Paul, who authored so much of the New Testament, the missionary who took the gospel to the Gentile world, he was able only to do so because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which drove him. We cannot do this on our own. First off, we must have the Holy Spirit driving us. Second off, we must have a band of believers surrounding us. Unified with Christ, unified with our brothers and sisters. It is so easily, it's easy at times to be overwhelmed by the task that God puts before us. We are called to reach the world, to be God's representative to those around us. And if we just take that at face value, that can be very overwhelming. When I was younger, I was given a book and, and it came out, I think in the early eighties. So some of you may be familiar with it, but it's called what to do when your mom and dad says, clean your room. Are, are y'all familiar with that book? So, some of you, yes, no. I was given that book. I don't know, maybe I needed a hint. Um, but I was given that book when I was a child and, and I liked to read as a child. And so I've read the book. Um, and, and one thing that has stuck with me to this day is like they, they were very practical in how a child should clean their room and to skip through the whole premise of it for time. Um, basically, it was to start with one corner and work your way out. Don't get overwhelmed by the whole concept, but to start with one corner and just begin the work there. Guys, we are to, that's what we have to do. Start in your corner. God has placed you where you are for a reason. Whether it's at work, at home, at school, wh wherever you are, that's where we are to start. Start in your corner and work your way out. Find two or three people <coughs> that, that God places on your heart and begin to pray for them. Ask God to work in their hearts. Ask God to give you wisdom. Ask God to give you an opportunity and the words to say to them. Because here's the deal, for a majority of the unchurched, they are waiting on an invitation. They are waiting on us to be bold enough to take Christ to them. Tom Rainer wrote the book, The Unchurched Next Door. And what he said, like, like he, he did polls and surveys and, and just, just accumulated so much data. And what he had to say is that 82% of the unchurched say they are somewhat likely to attend church if they're actually invited by a friend. 82% of our unchurched friends, family, neighbors say they are willing to attend with us if they actually get an invitation. Start in your corner, live with the mission, pursue unity and start where you are. In verse 17, in Christ Jesus said, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. <clears throat> For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed for the power of signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Again, it is the Holy Spirit doing the work in someone's heart, not us. But we get to be a part of it. We get to be there for it. And there is nothing greater. We sang just before I walked up here, um, we sing about how he has already won the battle. He has already accomplished the victory. The battle belongs to him. We just get to ride his coattails. So yesterday, 
uh, one of the, rec- the recreation that we did was, and I've got a video if, you, if you're interested in this, it was really cool. Uh, basically, we converted our gym, the FLC, into an indoor laser tag facility, and our students um, had a blast playing that. Um, some of our younger students either won or made it to the finals in the tournament, and I'm not saying they didn't play a part. They were definitely riding some coattails with some of the older students. Um, that they got to be a part of the victory, right, Jackson? (laughs) They got to celebrate the victory um, because of some guys who were just a little bit better shot than them. Um, But you know what? They were part of the team. They experienced the victory. They got to celebrate the win. And that is the exact same situation we find ourselves in with Christ. We ride, you know, with, you know, he, he has already won that victory. And because of that, by following him, by unifying ourselves with him, we get to celebrate that win as well. Finishing up this, this passage. <clears throat> so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Now where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. So we're, we're done. We're landing this plane right now, but we need to land with this thought. Paul says, my ambition is to preach the gospel. I love his language in this passage, his wording, what he says. This is a man who understood what was most important. This is a man who knew where he must be going because of his unification with Christ and his unification with his brothers and sisters. God's mission is to restore creation to himself, and we get to be a part of that. We are called to that same mission, to proclaim Christ to the masses. We start in our corner and we begin to work our way out. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory, says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors and everlasting splendors. Immortal horrors and everlasting splendors. That is what awaits every human being. One of those two. There is no third option. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendor. How strong is that wording that C.S. Lewis used? We are surrounded by immortals that God wants to restore to himself. It is simple. We pursue unity. We live with a purpose and we start in our corner. So my challenge for you as we're wrapping this up today is what is stopping you? Our students were challenged this weekend to step out of their comfort zone, to set aside the things that drive disunity amongst themselves for the glory of God. What is stopping you from doing the same thing? I'm gonna issue the same challenge that our students were issued last night. For some of you, the the thing that's stopping you is that you have never had that unity with Christ to begin with. Some of us in here have never said yes to Jesus to begin with. And if that's you, uh, David will be down here. He would love to talk to you about that. For some of you, and this may be the majority of you in here, you've said yes to Christ. You have, you, you can honestly say you are a son or a daughter of the King, but you are not living like that. So how can we be a part of the mission to proclaim the gospel when in our heart of hearts, we're not even living like we believe it. So for some of you, you need to get right with God yourself. And that may mean coming to the altar. That may mean grabbing somebody that that you are holding a grudge with or has hurt you or you have hurt and just having a time of confession. For some of you, option three is that you are a believer. You have surrendered yourself to him and you are living on mission. You are pursuing unity. And so for some of you, you just need to continue to pray for boldness. You need to continue to pray for opportunities. Ask God to present them to you so that you can continue to proclaim his mission to the masses. 
Guys, wherever it is that you fall, I pray that you would be obedient in saying yes to what he is calling you to do next. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. And I thank you for the fact that you are good. I thank you for the fact that in spite of our failures, in spite of our inadequacies, you continue to love us. You continue to pursue us. And Lord, for the ones in here today who have never said yes to you, for the ones watching online who have never said yes to you, Lord, I pray that today that would change. For the ones in here who, who have accepted you as their savior, who have proclaimed you as their Lord, but are not living like that. Lord, I pray they'd set aside whatever it is they are pursuing for your glory. I pray they'd understand that there is nothing in this world that even compares to your goodness. Lord, whatever it is you're calling us to do, I pray that we say yes to you. In your name we pray, amen. Selves out of here. Let's for God's sake, love with me. For God's so love, the world has